I'm at full draw and the bull comes from 50 yards to two Hmm. and I'm at full draw. His nose is about this far from my sight. And I'm like kind of stepping back because he is literally about to run over us. Not that they're violent animals. Like you're not getting a, Oh, he's going to charge me. You're more like how much closer is he coming? This segment of DOD TV is brought to you by Leopold American to the core. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. This is episode number 231. You're Tim Chelswick. You're Matt Drury. And this is presented by DeerCast. DeerCast. All right. This is the time of year where it's very important. <laughs> I looked at it yesterday, and uh, it was giving me just an okay, but I thought, eh, let's give it a shot. Turned mm-hmm. out to a good, and then back to an okay, and it turned out... <laughs> I must have been in the wrong spot. <laughs> and some people see that and they're like, oh, well, you know, what is this just, is this just kind of arbitrarily changing? Well, it's pulling in real time weather data. Yeah. And that's why it's because the weather is changing and the yeah. models are changing. So we want it to be as accurate as possible. That's why you may see some different results. Worked to my advantage in Kansas. It did not work to my advantage last night, but mm. man, it was windy. Like as I looked at the radar, it was just kind of a swirling wind mm. heading my way. Not great. <laughs> no. It wasn't great. <laughs> so. so deer can't come from any direction. Otherwise, they're going to wind you. Well, I, I don't even think it was that because we did see a deer pop out, but it was so windy. Mm-hmm. And, and that's something that DeerCast actually looks at as well. It was so windy. It was like 20, 25 mile an hour gust. Yeah. He come out and he was like spooky. They just don't like that. No, because the leaves are blowing. They don't know if something's coming to get them or if if, if it's the limbs or they have no idea. Yeah. So it's just they're spooky. Some hillbilly sitting in a blind it, waiting for him. And then as soon as it got dark... All the cameras <laughs> really lit up. Yep. So. Yeah, they're waiting you out. Yeah. So it's going to be a couple of days till I go back. <laughs> yeah, this weekend's going to be awesome. Though. Yeah. I think a lot of people are going to be out. And that's the beauty of Deer Castle looking at the 10 day is really kind of trying to plan ahead. And of course, yeah. yes, it does change hourly and it will change an update, but you kind of got an idea, a general idea of the weather pattern that's coming through the system coming mm-hmm. through. And this weekend should be good for most of middle America, really probably even the Northeast and the Southwest even because our Southeast rather, middle because East. <laughs> in the middle East too, <laughs> who knows? Do they got deer over there? <laughs> Pass. <laughs> so um, I have an apology to make. Let's hear it. I'm sorry. Well, we we should also say, joining us in a few minutes, Taylor Land. Yeah, she's been busy. They've had a f- exciting couple of weeks uh, between her hunt out, out in Utah and then what's been happening there in the uh, Iowa and Missouri camps. They've mm-hmm. had a busy, busy couple of weeks, so we're excited to have her on and l- let her take us through it. And uh, so you and I can live vicariously <laughs> through someone who's seeing <laughs> death firsthand. Tell me about killing deer. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to know about that. And elk. Can't forget <laughs> <Yes>. that. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so my apology is for last episode. What was that? It was a Terry's episode. Yep. Yeah. It was your dad. Okay. Your dad and I had a quick conversation before the show to reference Murder, She Wrote. You thought you were going to get me, but I just thought he could actually maybe like Murder, She Wrote because he's so old. (laughs) Turns out he doesn't, and you guys are just messing with me. The sense of wonderment on your face, though, (laughs) it was really rewarding because you're like, wait, you just talked about that last week. Yeah, like I was amazed that anybody would reference (laughs) Murder, She Wrote twice on this podcast. It was a setup. It was a setup. Sorry. You keep trying to get me. You know, no, like I mean, the teleprompter that, the other day, like all these things, but mm-hmm. you don't really get me that I keep well. things spicy. It's fun. You're a bad prankster. <laughs> <laughs> Who slashed my truck tires? Now Tim? we're talking. Now we're talking. You, got me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go on a hunt today because I have four flats. Now that be a you. prank. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we should also uh, welcome our newest Rack Pack members on the 100% Wild uh, Facebook group page. Yeah. So if you're, if you're uh, not following along yet, it used to be called The Crew. Terry mm-hmm. relabeled it the Rack Pack. Executive decision. And uh, we have nothing to say about that because we're not executives. So. Just work here. Yes. So Nathan Griggs, Phil Murray, Aaron Brown, Archery, Aaron Bowen Archery, sorry, Ben McNulty, Megan Nile. I'm always surprised when we see girls on this list, to be honest with you. Thad, Lundine, Dalton, you put a lot of names on here. I'm just going to skip ahead. And at the end, we had Brady Stockman. <laughs> so I love the fact that Aaron's last name is Archery. That really lends itself to being a bow hunter. I think that's a setup. That is uh, not his real name. All right. ABA. We should get to our guest. Can't keep her waiting. Taylor Drury Land Archery. 
<laughs> what's, <laughs> what's up, Yo, Dave? yo, what's up? <laughs> How's it going? It's going good. We're just floating along deer camp here. <laughs> so where are you at these days? Are you in Iowa there? Yeah, this I'm at the Iowa house. I've been hunting in Missouri, so just driving back and forth, but been in Iowa for camp sake at least. Yeah, so you've really, as I alluded to, you had a jam-packed couple of weeks here between your your Utah adventure and and yeah. your dad killed that giant in Iowa a few days ago. You guys yeah. had the Catch a Dream Hunter that had some mm-hmm. success. So you've had a really busy couple of weeks here, and we were kind of excited to hear more and more detail about it. Yeah, it it really has been just a great couple of weeks. Like you said, it's like from Utah, which that was a, a whirlwind in itself. I mean, the just the craziest, like most incredible yet challenging week of my life, I would say. And then you get here and the catch a dream hunt was awesome. I mean, Bella killed that giant 160 <laughs> stud. Deer. And and it, and her family was amazing. So we got to spend about four days with them. And then, yeah, dad's buck literally reappeared. He's been gone for months. He reappears and dad shoots him the next night. So it's just been like, what just happened the last two weeks? (laughs) He's really good at that. (laughs) I've had bucks appear and disappear all the time. I never seem to kill them. They usually just disappear on me. There's no reappearance (laughs) factor. if they reappear, you still have to be there to kill it. (laughs) Right, right. Or they reappear like January 16th and doesn't do you any good. Yeah, Yeah, he's really good at that. So, so but, tell us about your elk hunt, like that, like going out West and hunting elk has always been a dream of mine. And, uh, and you had, I mean, you killed an amazing bull and had some crazy encounters along the way. Kind of walk us through how the, all that came about. So I guess we'll back up to early summer. Um, Austin, and I have a great friend by the name of West Edmond and he was generous enough to give me this tag. And I honestly, I mean, it's a, it's a dream hunt. It's a bucket list hunt. And so for him to, to even think about giving me the tag is just a huge, I mean, I, it's hard to even put into words like the generosity of him doing that. And so once I found out I had it and knew up front, yes, it's an any weapon tag, but goal is make it a bow hunt. So it's like all summer long, I was like, I've got to get my pound up. You know, it's like I knew that going from a 280 pound animal to about a thousand pound animal, like I had to do some work in there with these little chicken arms to get my poundage up. And so I worked hard all summer. I finally got to my bow. I think it's at about 51, 52 right now. Wow. And then hunt kicks off. And it's like, I was anxious all summer, like just thought about it nonstop, prepped a lot, shot a lot, but, and Matt could probably attest this. Matt's been on the ranch. Uh, he went, you went with loophole, what, two, th- three years it was, ago. Uh, I think it was 2017. So it's been a couple of years now. Yeah. Four years ago. But it's like you truly don't I don't think you can honestly 100 percent prep for elk hunting, whether that's the physical aspect of it or even just being in like being amongst an animal that large, that Mm -hmm. loud, especially the week that I was there. They were peak of the rut for (laughs) us. But it's like you can't physically or emotionally prepare for what even happened. And it just I mean, the entire week we hunted hard six days or six and a half days with a bow. I mean, hard. I, we ended up calculating it after the fact. So I was like, I really want to know kind of miles, steps, floors, all that. We did about 39 miles and we actually hunted a place on the ranch called Hell's Canyon. And it literally, it, it is that, (laughs) I mean, it hurt, it's steep, it's up and down, but it's, I don't know. It was just incredible. And the fact that it's like, it's so much different than whitetail hunting. We're so used to getting in those muddies or getting in those hawk blinds and you're waiting for the white tails to come to you. So it was very different and eye opening for me to be literally in the middle of the mountains when you're just going to them, no matter what the terrain looks like, especially I, my husband was guiding me and he doesn't stop. And so Wade and I oftentimes are looking at each other like this is the impossible. <laughs> We're gonna die. But here we go. <laughs> like we have no choice. We we ought we ought to say real quickly, just so we don't lose our rating for everyone, that it's Hex Canyon. <laughs> you don't want to get Hex. instead of a PG rating, go up to an R. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's that, it, yeah, it's, it's the name of the it's the actual like legit name. They have signs and everything, but Heck Canyon um, signs all over the place. <laughs> yes. But yeah, we did 39 miles. I think we ended up like 95,000 steps. And then Aust um, had a different app that I did not have. And he said we did about like 700 to 750 floors in six days. So 
It was hard. <laughs> it was very hard, but it was so rewarding. Just and- like deer season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't think I do 90,000 steps the whole entire four months of deer season. Yeah. Yeah. But, so did it kind of remind you of turkey hunting in the sense that you'd hear one, you'd go after it, you know, yeah. there's that intensity of trying to get literally in front of them, you know, or next to them within 20, 30 steps, you know, is that kind yes. of what it would remind you of? For sure. I, and a lot of people even said that before I went, cause again, it was my first elk hunt. I really like did not know what to expect when we were actually in with the bulls. And it's just like turkey hunting, but yet on a bigger scale, like I didn't, I learned a lot, but I did not realize like how reliant or how much you rely as a hunter on a cow call, which Austin was our caller. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if we didn't have a cow call, you're not with it. You're not getting on bulls that week that I was there. I was there the third week of September. I mean, it is literally all call oriented, but it's like, you better be ready and set up because the second that you hit that call, I mean, you're literally just surrounded and it's just a matter of, you know, what bull's going to come in or if they're old enough or, or whatever. So <laughs> Tim, go ahead. Well, I, I just like making noises. Okay. I should do that a little more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I was going to ask was how did you, how did the aging process go for you? Because for me, that was definitely a several day process of understanding, you know, looking at, it's not just body type, but also looking at their headgear and they age them a lot of times by what's on their head because, you know, for us kind of layman, it was, oh, they all look pretty similar. They're all pretty big. It's a good looking bull to me, but for those guys, they're much like Mark or or Terry and and Whitetails, they are managing for an upper age class. So they, they're pretty strict and stringent on that to get the world-class bulls that they have. So how did that part work for you? How long did it take you to kind of really understand it? Or was, did you kind of pick up on it right away? No, I would say it took me a couple days and, and Wade too. I mean, it, it really was Wade's first big elk hunt. And so at first, like Austin laughs, he's like, every time I would look at you and Wade, (laughs) your, your guys's eyes are like this big, no matter the bull that's coming in. Um, but I would say like to, I don't know, be confident. And when we would see a bull coming because us would normally step back. And so it, it was normally Wade and I towards the middle of the hunt, having to make that decision unless we had the time to turn around and look at him. But most of the time we didn't, I would say like two full days, I'd say on day three, that's where I was like, okay, I'm starting to get this. And that is the crazy thing. Like you said, like whitetails, you're always looking at their body, their belly, their neck, their head. These bulls that are, are on, um, the ranch that I was hunting, like it mostly is by rack. You know, uh, they're, I think Oz said their average bull age that they kill is eight years old, which is a very old bull. And so I think what, what I was learning as we go is it's like, if there's not much difference, but and body wise from like a four-year-old to an eight-year-old mm-hmm. bull. And so that's when you do start looking at racks, not that we're rack hunt or score hunting, but you almost do have to look at that because you're just looking at bulls that are ancient, you know? And they're looking for like certain eye guard length. They're looking at like their, their fours. Yeah. Front. yeah. yeah. And and then yeah. how big the fours are. I, I don't know. That was, you know, it, yeah. that was the learning curve for me. It's like, okay, I started looking instead of, Hey, here's a giant elk it, starting mm-hmm. to hone in on, all right, what's his eye guards look like? Uh-huh. What's his, is he a, you know, is he a six by six, five by five? What, it, what is he? And, and starting to look kind of more to the rack and detail of the rack. Cause I'm sure somebody that's hunted their whole lives, I'm sure Austin could tell between a four year old and an eight year old, but I sure as hell couldn't, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't either. I, we actually, Josh is just uploading the elk hunt right now to YouTube, the, the deer season 21 um, edition of it, but it's pretty insane. He, <laughs> I know he spent hours and hours like going through the footage. We had so many, so much footage but I hope that everybody that watches the episode on YouTube or it's going on DeerCast as well, like can just see the amazing country we were in. I think I drew back four or five times. Oh boy. Um, and op- people that have followed along, like yeah, I did switch to rifle the last, I think two hours I ended up killing about 30 minutes before my hunt ended. Um, but the bow portion of it, yes. Part of me, like deep down, I wish so badly that I could have, 
got it done with a bow. Mm -hmm. But, and then at the same time, like when I got home, you're just physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted. It's like, I have so much respect for elk hunters and just Western hunters as a whole. It's just, it's challenging. It's hard. And, um, it, it's crazy. Like when you add that physical aspect of it and then also have a bow in your hand, I mean, it's just hard. And my range was limited too, which, which had a lot to do, uh, with many encounters that we had, you know, a lot of hunters that can go out there and probably shoot 40, 50, 60 at an elk, um, are a lot better off than I was in. Like we were trying to be smart and make sure, okay, even though I'm at this poundage, mm -hmm. let's really try to limit ourselves to 30 and in. And when you're deciding on that 30 and in, like it's hard to get a bull there and to keep them calm and not let them know that you, a camera guy and a guide are there, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think they, you know, West Western hunters probably give us flatlanders a lot of crap for how easy it is. It's just different. I don't, it's just different hunting. There's no comparison really. I mean, yes, they definitely got a much harder as far as terrain and, you know, what kind of shape they got to be in and the ranges that they can shoot, you know, and I, yeah. I total respect for mm -hmm. that style of hunting. It's just totally different. There is no comparison in my opinion. Yeah. But, I mean, to me, yeah. it just seems like the hardest part of Western hunting is growing an ironic mustache. <laughs> so like handlebars <laughs> or yeah. Yeah. flat bill hat Wax goes it. over your ears. <laughs> Peas and carrots. <laughs> Green Leading up, to the, leading up to the hunt, everybody kept asking me or dad privately, like, hey, are you going with her? Are you going to hunt with her? And dad's like, no. And everyone's like, wait, why isn't he going? And he goes, I don't like where they live. <laughs> and, <laughs> and one day, I think it was day two, we, we hit service because most of the time we didn't have cell service. And I text him. It was like literally 730 a.m. And we had already gone over two miles. And I'm just like, Whew, here we go. And I text dad and I'm like, I now know what you mean by, I don't like where else live. <laughs> like it is no joke. <laughs> yeah. I have to go into heck Canyon to shoot your, <laughs> shoot your animal. No, thank you. <laughs> and Mark, yeah. you know, they used to, in the nineties, they hunted, elk, mm -hmm. you know, quite a bit. We had a few uh, elk titles back in the day. Raging bulls, I think was one of them. And, uh, we used, I'm trying to think that that title went on for a few, for a few times. And then we went into the book. Elk Madness and the big game series. So yeah. we used to, you know, in the nineties. And, but I think, you know, once we really started to get our niche in the whitetail world, they just thought, eh, let's stick to Iowa, Missouri, <laughs> Illinois. It's <laughs> a lot of work to, yeah, yeah, to go out there. Like why not build a system where the animals come to you? And it, it's expensive. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, it's expensive in both yeah. ways, but like those like Pat Nicole's and crush and those guys that you know the bone collectors all those guys that travel so much i i always think of that it's like man you know from an economic standpoint of what we do in the outdoor industry it's mm -hmm. that's it's really costly to go on those big game hunts a lot of risk like yeah you kill something you just, you're just out of luck you just invested a whole lot of money in conservation yeah yeah so i i think that's part of what plays into mark and terry's decision through time to kind of start you know, honing in more in the Midwest. It's, Dad always says, if I can't drive there, I'm not going. So, and yes, you can drive out West, but and if, if you knew them, they're not driving out West. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, no, so, but it really was, it was a great, it's funny that you mentioned like the crush Lee was actually there in camp with me. The camp nice. was filled with so many very experienced elk hunters, but Lee was like the best to be around because even the night before my hunt, like Lee sat down with Wade and I, and he's showing all these kills that either him or Tiff are just people that they've had on the crush and he's going through kills and he's showing like, okay, this is a good shot placement or okay. On this one, we should have been a little bit more back and a little bit more low, but he was like my freaking cheerleader the whole week. And I appreciated that a lot just because I had called Tiff before the hunt and I'm like, Hey, like, can we go over my setup stuff? Just because again, dad and I are like, we don't know. Like mm -hmm. I only shoot 51, 52 pounds. Like what head is the best? You know, what am I shooting the right arrow weight? Stuff like that. But Lee and Tiff helped a ton as far as advice and making me feel confident that my bow set up. Yes. I didn't end up killing with my bow, but that my bow set up, we think would have done the job if it would have happened. So did, did Lee say anything about what shot placement as it relates to like how different it might be from a white tail? No, I think for the most part, like at least what I took, it's very similar, but he's like, main thing to remember, he's like, you have got to be off of that shoulder because you cannot go through an elk shoulder, no matter if you're shooting 50 pounds or 80 pounds. And the other thing is that he's like on whitetails, a lot of people will split a whitetail into thirds. 
And he's like, I like to only tell people to split an elk into just half and you just shoot dead middle. And he's like, cause you got to remember, he's like a white tail lungs are about this. He's like an elk lungs are about this. And so that was another thing that I took away is like basically draw a line through the middle of the body. Mm -hmm. Don't do like a white tail, kind of what we do. It's like, okay, here's lungs, here's a heart, aim both if they're going to duck, stuff like that. Cause he's like, elk are not going to duck you as much as a a white tail does or sometimes do. So do they talk at all? Like, was there a safety briefing? Cause you you know, you always see viral clips of an elk getting shot and like running headlong into the hunter or just coming in hot and not stopping. Safety briefing was Wade step in front. (laughs) Take one for the team, brother. We had an encounter. It's on the deer season 21. It's actually the, we cut the, this one that we're launching on Drew outdoor social is the moment, but I'm at full draw and the bull comes from 50 yards to two. Hmm. And I'm at full draw. His nose is about this far from my sight. And I'm like kind of stepping back because he is literally about to run over us. Not that they're violent animals. Like you're not getting a, Oh, he's going to charge me. You're more like, how much closer is he coming? And Wade said he could literally like feel my body, like coming backwards. But they had told us that at the beginning, they're like, most of the time, because the caller is float calling behind you or to to one of your sides, they're going to bat. So that's they're normally like Austin would position himself. They're trying to get the bull to pass you so that you have a broadside. So he's like, if anything, the guide is the one that has to be conscious of the fact that when it say I were to shoot and that bull was broadside facing him, mm-hmm. um, that is when they're trying to be aware of then where the bull is running. Cause they don't, they're not looking at where they're going, you know, sure. but it was crazy. It really was not I'm to one up you, not to one up you, but that happened to me with a cow last week. <laughs> wow. <Really? laughs> That's like a Midwestern. And it actually did charge us and it raised the the tracker off the ground like six inches. It came straight for us. Whitetail hunting is dangerous stuff, man. Yeah. So (laughs) So my life flashed before. The kid that was with me, we took a guy from back home, Nathan, and I think he was crapping his pants. (laughs) (laughs) We 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 drove away. I was like, holy crap. I was like, I've never had that happen. It literally lifted us off the ground. So I can't imagine as Taylor's standing there all hundred pounds of her full draw and an elk who's actually, you know, bigger and, mm-hmm. and more aggressive. Let's be honest. It's and the rut. Got some headgear and he's yeah. touching you basically with his nose. I would yeah. have been, I would have been freaked. <laughs> yeah. Unreal. It, it's crazy, but it's, it's cool to see him up that close. I mean, it's just, it's unlike, and when he's standing there, he's just bugling. I mean, he's screaming and I'm just like, I, I, at a lot of points, I'm like, is this real life? I mean, it just doesn't seem real when you're in those moments at the time. You need your Walker's game ears blowing your eardrum out. Yeah. I mean, that's a loud sound too. It's very loud. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's not, it's not a competition. Last week I had a, there's a neighborhood cat that I don't, I mean, it's a, <laughs> you should see the way this cat looks at me, but it kind of like did a 45 Fair degree hate. angle in front of my path. Like it came is it know, 10, 15 yards. I, I'm colorblind. It doesn't matter. Like, I, don't, <laughs> I don't see that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. But it was a close call. Sounds I mean, scary, so Tim. We all got. We all had close did, calls here recently. Did you go back home and Beth I coddle told, you? I told Beth. <laughs> Rock you. To I sleep. stayed in for the night. Had some warm milk and went to bed. I left my dentures in overnight. I didn't even take them out. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Matt's gonna get killed by a cow. Tim's gonna get killed by a cow. Or at least clawed by one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know if he's clawed or declawed. I mean, who knows? Very dangerous sounding, oh. Tim. <laughs> yeah. I saw Jim Shockey just post about a cat that uh, bit his sister and her she's about to lose her finger over. Yeah. It. I mean, did you see that? Oh, no. I didn't, but did you see that post? She's no, like I didn't. had like t- couple surgeries and it's the whole finger, I guess, like to the bone got infected yeah. and uh, like she's, they're trying to save it from amputation. This yeah. is just this week. I said, the, so this is very topical about cats and how you, how dangerous they really are, Tim. Be careful. The first time yeah. I went to Mark's house, he was like, Hey Tracy, get the cat out. Let's let Tim meet the cat. And oh she was like, God. no, don't do that to him. Everybody. Yeah. Bella. Literally- 
that is that is the most vicious cat I've ever met. Like, unless it's my mom, she will attack. She will bite. She will go after you. So anyone that doesn't know her, like the second they walk in the door, dad's like, pet the cat. She's so sweet. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> Don't do it. It's, Don't a do it. it's a trap. Yeah. And that's at that point, like everyone that's ever met the cat, we all just stand there in silence and look at each other. We're like, okay. Well, this has been kitty talk. <laughs> Yeah. We, yeah. we should probably we should probably help out one of our listeners with yeah. this week's question. If they haven't the been helped out by now. Look, yeah, at they all should the be information us. we've given them today, thanking and paying us for this service. Uh, that'd be a first to be paid. <laughs> Give us money. The question of the day is probably brought to you by Plano Cases. Protect your passion. Hey guys, love the podcast. Oh, thank you. Wanted to get your thoughts about the best way to travel from your cabin to your deer stand on private property would it be walking taking a quiet vehicle or even investing in an electric bicycle especially when the leaves are crunchy in late fall um again constant debate between us hunters and wanted to get your thoughts appreciate it thank you so the question is how to best access your stand and uh, he's got a couple of answers he's kind of already given, but <clears throat> I, I would question how far away is it? You know, you know, if you're talking like Rick Malik in Ohio, he's going up and down these this huge terrain mm-hmm. and it takes forever to get back to a spot. The e-bike and he's got that road ridge. It's the perfect solution for him in that scenario. I'm sure if you, you know, if you can afford it, one of those EV units or like the tracker off road, something like that would be an option. But if you're not very far from your stand, you know, the reality is I'd probably just walk to it. I don't know. Taylor, what do you think? Yeah, I think mostly we always either have two or two options. It's either walk. I mean, you're driving with your truck. If you're within a hundred yards or so, maybe a little more, we're walking. But like last night, actually dad ended up filming me in Missouri. It's like, we got close enough to where we could walk with the tractor and then walk the rest of the way in. But we always like, no matter if we're walking or driving in, we're always keeping the wind in our face, never going that way. You know, another thing you could do, if you do have to walk in your spot, we spray nose jammer on the bottom of our boots. Mm -hmm. And I know Tim, you do that quite a bit too. And you're, you're probably, your scenario is you know, where you're kind of in urban areas and it's smaller plots, it's pretty vital to make sure your trail is the right access in because you come from anywhere. Exactly. So maybe take us through what your process is there. So I use the wax stick of the nose jammer and I put it on the lugs of my boots and I put on the side, pretty much anything on my booth, I think is going to come in contact with the ground. So why the wax versus the spray? I mean, any thought process there? I I just like, I can see that it resides longer. Like there's a residue on the boots longer. So like maybe every other hunt I'll apply it because it just, it stays on there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So like I said, it probably depends on, on, um, Joe's setup exactly how far in he's going. For instance, on this new lease, you know, where we park our vehicles, it just so happens we, you know, there's a, a decent spot that's right behind the little shack that we park sure. our vehicles. And so in that instance, we're just going to walk back from the cabin to the stand. We're just going to walk back there, but I rest assured, like there's a little logging road that heads back that way that there's a, you know, scrape line on. I'm not going to walk that logging road. I'm going to walk just inside of it and kind of go straight line yeah. into my stand, but I'm going to spray my boots with nose jammer and then, you know, make sure I've sent crushed up, you know, my gear, my pack and all all that stuff and minimize any, any mm-hmm. scent that we have. So like I said, I think it depends on where he's going. Yeah. 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 That. And like you said, distance and, and even like how you walk, I, I see more deer nowadays that when I'm walking to the stand and oftentimes I'm walking through the timber, I will I'll maybe go 30 yards and pause for a minute. And I'll like, usually I'll kind of pause by a tree. Like I'm not going to stand out in the middle of nothing. I'm going to stand by something, yeah. but the, I just, I tend to see more deer. And I think like, even if there are deer that are bedded, but you're in their audible range, they're more used to, I mean, most animals don't just march point A to point B through yeah, the woods. Kind of meander through. They pause. And yeah. so the, the more I do that, the more deer I see. So how, how you walk, I think also makes a difference, especially if there's leaves on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And the leaves. So 
<clears throat> what we try to do in the off season or even like say end of summer, August, one last check of our tree stands, we'll go in and try to make sure our path in is clear to the stand. Sure. Obviously, once the leaves start falling, it's going to fall on your path, but you'd be surprised. Say you have to access it you know, in the morning and during the rut and, and the leaves are on it. Well, when you head on back out, it, it's not hard to at least clear the sticks. And I try not to touch with my, my hands mm -hmm. unless I got my yeah. gloves on, but, you know, just kind of clear the sticks aside and, you know, the leaves kind of are what they are. I mean, you could clear that stuff aside if there's real, real bad areas where mm -hmm. it's super loud, you clear that with your feet or whatever. Sure. But if you've had already cleared your path to the stand before the season started, it makes that a lot easier, mm -hmm. you know, where it's, it's, you got a little bit bigger of a path to go through. So right. preparation there is probably key to once the leaves fall. Yeah. hundred percent makes a big difference. Yeah. So Joe, good question, man. If uh, if you want to be on the show and leave a question, just go to the show notes and click the little leave question here link and it'll take you to a page where you can do that. So Taylor, take us through the the hunt the other night with your dad, <clears throat> you know, where he killed the, that giant. I know you guys weren't hunting together. Were you in Missouri that night and he was in Iowa? Yeah. Or, so yeah. what was that like? So he gets that picture and I find out about it I don't know, a long time before the hunt, it's like the craziest thing. And we kind of talk about it like post hunt stuff. I had the weirdest intuition that he was going to kill him. Like he told me that he got the picture and I was like, he's going to kill him tonight. Like, and yes, maybe it has something to do has, with his track record. <laughs> it has, yeah. Yes. And no, but it's like, I had this, I just had a feeling. I was like, almost like I could see the dang future and all night. Carson was filming me. Perry was with, uh, dad and I, well, Carson and I were in Missouri because Wade was up in Alberta and all night, like even Carson and I going into the hunt, I was like, dad's going to kill tonight. Like we're going to be hunting. And I checked my phone all night long and waiting and waiting and waiting. And so, you know, we're all hyped up before the hunt and everything, but as it goes on, then all of a sudden I get 200 yards and coming 100 yards and coming. And I'm like, okay, who texts hundred yards and coming when they're staring at a 216 besides yeah. dad? <laughs> and, uh, then like 14 minutes go by and my phone lights up. So I have Carson start filming because I just knew I was like, it happened. Like the 14 minute block of nothing there is something. And I looked down and it said down bingo, like in all caps. And oh my gosh, Carson and I got there as fast as we could. It was right, you know, right at dark. By the time I got the text, there was a little lag between the service and we went and recovered them together. And just, I mean, the pictures do not do the deer justice. He is just the most giant, like large bodied, huge head. It's just, everything about the deer is humongous. And I mean, it was a, it was a celebration. Dad was insanely happy. We were all happy, but mm -hmm. it was just so cool. I mean, dad's always so humble about it, you know, but it was awesome to have the four. It was Josh Carson, myself, Perry, dad, and uh, we recovered him. We got him into the hatch. We, we scored him. We celebrated. I mean, it was it was awesome. It's just a beautiful deer. The pictures don't do him justice until you see that picture in the tracker where yeah. you guys yeah. are in it with him. And then you're like, holy crap. Well, <laughs> that, he's huge. Yeah. That and it, in the footage, like the pre-roll, you see there's like a three and a half year old buck in the plot. And then. And then disappearing act is just kind of above him. And the camera goes up. You're like, that's a different animal. Like that's a completely different type of animal. Yeah. Just, just, yes. com just night and day difference between the two, just in terms of sheer scale. And that, and disappearing act was farther behind the other deer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The footage is up in deer cast right now. The actual, like, you know, raw yeah. kind of hunt clip on Mark's journal entry. It's up in deer cast right now. If you want to check it out, the kill shot, everything. And then, yeah you know, the crew up there, they're working on the deer season 21 episode and they're trying to get it up in a few days here. So, uh, yeah. the turnaround's really quick, but, um, so by the time this podcast airs, it might be up by then, but at the very yeah. least it is going to, it is already up in deer cast, the raw yeah. kind of kill footages. Yeah, it should be up here. I know they worked through the night, uh, both from last night trying to get it edited. Um, it should be up soon, but uh, and we actually, we've been joking about it. It's like we use this deer over analogics or conics picture as a static image or a thumbnail for deer season 21 on episode two, because dad was like, go ahead and use it. We won't see him. Like he's not coming back. And that was like 
a, the dead honest truth. Dad was like, he ain't coming back. Use the photo. You know, it's a beautiful deer. And then all of a sudden dad gets that picture and was like, are you serious? Like, I mean that he wasn't even on his radar because that deer literally comes and goes and hasn't been here for months. Wow. So crazy. His mistake. <laughs> well, it says something, you know, to the kind of the management practices they put the, the biologic and you know all the food plot architecture that they do yeah. all the hard work they do in the off season you know even mark didn't think he'd come back but that's the stuff that draws them back mm -hmm. you know they do everything right and all those things stacked up to give them an, an advantage or a reason for that deer to want to be there yeah. when he hadn't previously so it's just it's amazing but mark continuously will put himself in the best position to succeed and it's by preparation it's always by preparation mm -hmm. and here's another example so pretty awesome yeah. pretty cool yeah it, it was a, a night and a deer that we won't forget. And he made a smoke and shot too. Like yeah, that's, yeah. I swear he, was, he was almost more excited about the shot because he's like, you know, last season, like made some mediocre shots and he's like, I kicked myself. He's been practiced. Literally we walk outside, he's shooting at 60, 70, 80, a hundred every single day, just trying to make sure he's dialed mm. and just like absolutely smoked that deer. Yeah, which he did. It's hard to like hold your composure and make that shot at 43 yards, you know? Yeah. He, it was a perfect shot. Great angle. Yeah. yeah just yeah. all came together. And and there's, yeah. there's a while there where it's like, okay, shoot. Okay. Shoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, yeah. he's not, and he's like yeah. just waiting for the perfect moment. And it's ugh, like, I, 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 like my body, I'm having a visceral response right now. Just thinking about the footage. Cause it's like, it's every hunter's dream to have a, to see a deer like that and have him come so close. And then you see uh, the relief yeah. on Mark's face once they pan back to him. And it's, it's like, even he was looked amazed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that it happened. yeah. He was like, thank God I hit where I'm aiming. <laughs> we yeah. gave him a lot of crap last, last year. And Don't the funny thing surprised. was, is like, the deer even got closer, which people will see in the full edit. The deer had gotten closer. He thought he was going to continue to come and then he gets further. So he actually ended up having to shoot farther than he was originally. Cause wow. he's like, I thought the deer was just coming in, but uh, instead he was going out. <laughs> pretty but, cool stuff. Taylor, do you have a premonition about my hunt this weekend? <laughs> you know, it's the safe buck safe. Hunt. Hey, the weather's looking awesome. Like deer cast this weekend looks killer. Mm -hmm. So I'll write down. Taylor says conditions are favorable. <laughs> You're like a magic eight ball. I didn't know she was a savant. We should have had her in the ad that we just shot with Terry. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> did, did you see that with dad yet? I, I don't uh -uh. know. If the ad's on. We had him stop by one day. It was when it was so warm. He was passing through and yeah. uh, we shot a ad for deer cast where he's a, um, what would you call fortune it? teller? Yeah. Fortune teller. And he's yeah. got a crystal ball and we put a little, he's got turban turban on everything. And everything. It's hilarious. Oh my gosh. That we, is funny. we should have shot it with you. <laughs> yeah. Wild, but I'm glad it all happened. Like it's been a crazy two, three weeks. So hopefully this weekend's good. We're going to have a bunch of, I'm sure you and Scott will be out. I'll be out. Wade's Wade will be out. We got a lot of people. Our dad will be out again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got a lot of people hunting for sure. Yeah, it should be good. I something something's gonna die. Yeah, yeah. So, White tails are in trouble. So. Just a matter yeah. of who's behind. <laughs> Probably not us, mm. but <laughs> you never know. Hey, you never know. Things uh, haven't been looking so good in my couple spots lately, but I will say the pictures are starting to turn around a little bit. But I just need I need yeah. this weather to get yeah. them. I think the acorns are killing me yeah. currently, yeah. which that's right where you hunt, right yeah. in the middle of that stuff. Which, so. is, which is not bad, although like I'd like them to come to the plot. So, yeah. I, and I had my buck coming in the first time this has ever happened to me before. I was going to turn my cameras on as my buck is at thirty five yards back in the timber, and I bumped my bow and happened to hit my handheld release, and it oh. just was enough to fire it off and it dropped and hit the metal. Cause you leave it on the D loop. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And so it, with my deer at 35 yards, my handheld true fire release just falls onto the metal platform and oh. um, I, my stomach dropped. So what the deer do? He stopped for maybe 30 seconds and then put his head back down and continued to feed my direction. So I had, I think six cameras with me in the tree at that time. So I had, and he was coming in from behind and so I didn't have a shot opportunity. I had the camera arm swung all the way over here to the right. So I had to take it to the left side of the tree. And when I look back to see where he was, he was staring up in my direction and he must've seen the movement. He didn't win me. He didn't see my silhouette, 
but it was enough to where he wasn't going to tolerate it. And he just kind of turned and started feeding away from me. Brutal. It, <laughs> it's terrible. I know the feeling. Because I was getting ahead of myself like, oh, here, this could be my season right here. Like I could start taking Sophie out to hunt. I could get, you know, some friends that, but I'd kind of my chickens before they were hatched. And that's, it's amazing. Cause it's almost like the deer has that instinct of man. The, as soon as you get that feeling like it's going to happen, that's when it, starts, it seems like something yep. tends to go wrong. Like you yep. get too sure of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like I said, that's never happened to me before, but it's like, it's the worst thing that could possibly happen in the moment. And that's what happened. So it didn't fall to the ground though. It didn't. Uh, it, I, I reached down, I, I picked it up. I had another one in my pack. So even if it fell, it wasn't the yeah. end of the world. It was just, it was a combination of the noise and then the movement. Sure. And it was just more than he was, yeah. was going to tolerate. Yeah, man. <laughs> so it'll, Hopefully make for a more layered and textured story when I, when I <laughs> kill them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, how about we get to the wildlife word? How about it? Let's do it. <laughs> the wildlife word is brought to you by Lacrosse, makers of superior boots for work and for hunting. Hunt miles ahead with Lacrosse. And we got a pretty cool little giveaway we're doing this uh, this week. How would you like to win a new pair of boots? I I would. Sorry. Oh, uh, you I'm are, not eligible. You're excluded from this. Okay, got it. So, Taylor, do you want to walk folks through how they could potentially win a new pair of lacrosse boots? Yeah, so I think we kind of talked about before this podcast is we're going to do two giveaways, right? This month and next month, which is cool in kind of two different ways. So, first way is any, uh, what was it called? Rack Pack? Rack pack? Taylor must not be a part of the rack pack. <laughs> <laughs> like what's the name of it again? Well, the, the name just changed. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> it was the, it was the hundred uh, percent wild uh, Facebook crew. Yep. But now yep. it's the rack pack. Terry renamed it. So we're in the initial pack. stages. So it, it's, it's basically solidifying. We're trying to give these guys an edge cause they're, and girls cause they're the diehard fans, right? So, yeah. So it's like this month during Bucktober, we're giving your guys as insiders the opportunity at the giveaway. And then when we roll into Sweet November, we're just going to launch it on all Drury Outdoor social channels. We're going to come up with a fun way of what people or listeners have to submit or viewers. Um, something that they have to submit uh, that makes them work a little bit. And then um, we'll have our social team go through and pick a winner and send them a free pair of boots. Perfect. So it'd be fun. Yeah. So for this one, this first episode, the one you're listening to right now, just have to be a member of the Facebook crew or the Rack Pack. So you go to 100% Wild Rack Pack. Is that what they type in the search box? Yeah. It, feature? It, it, yeah. I think the, the exact title is 100%. And I'll link it up in the show notes. Okay. But it's 100% Wild Podcast rack pack. Okay. And that's in Facebook. And if you're a member of that, uh, you're going to automatically have a chance to win mm -hmm. and we'll or just you should give me money. Okay. We can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you $5. Hey, <laughs> you, you win a left pair, a left side of the boot. And so, okay. So all they got to do is be a member of the rack. Pack. We'll go through at the end of this week and I'll pull mm -hmm. kind of a list of all the members mm -hmm. and randomly select someone to win a pair of boots, get in touch with them. And then you tell me the size and what you want. And we'll get you set up. You remember what pair of boots it is from lacrosse? Well, I, I think it depends if it's a, it a male sport? or a female. Oh, okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. So pretty cool. All you got to do is join up in the, uh, the rack pack and you'll be eligible. Yeah. So. Okay. Let's hear it. This wildlife word is delicious. <clears throat> it's yeah, about persimmons. Did I, didn't is, you make me try one of those last year? Well, I think, I think you tried it of your own volition. I don't think I forced you into it. Mm, not but, how I recall it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you did. And you were nonplussed. It was not bad. Yeah. Kind of like a kiwi or something. Yeah. Yeah. Very sweet. All right. The wildlife. Oh, I already, I already said that. American persimmon trees. They are dioecious. They're delicious. What you read oh, that I, wrong? I spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well. We're all done here. <laughs> okay. American persimmon trees are dioecious, which means that A, they have edible fruit. B, they could grow faces and speak a rudimentary language. C, they have a natural insecticide in their bark. Or D, each tree is either male or female. Hmm. Taylor, we always let our guests go first. Holy smokes. I think C. 
Okay, they have a natural insecticide in their bark. It'd be pretty handy. I'm going to go with um, D. Each tree is either male or female. That's true. Ah. D, ah, D is dangerous. right. Yeah. Ding, a lot ding. of trees will have male and female plants or flowers on each, uh, on the same tree and they can kind of cross pollinate. Persimmons need other persimmon trees around too. Pollen. Hmm. And you don't, I mean, I don't, on the two farms I hunt, you don't see many on the farms that I hunt, mm-hmm. many persimmon trees, but man, deer love them when they you do. got them. They do. Yeah. There, there's a corner uh, of my, the, the bourbon property that I hunt, there's a corner where like three tree lines come together and there's probably eight persimmon trees back in there. Nice. And you start getting into late October and early November and they're just they're they're all over the place and the deer hit it so hard. It's like having a little apple orchard there. <laughs> I'll pick a few and eat them myself. I I happen to really like them. I see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you spit the seeds out. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get any parasites or <laughs> four? <I>, okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now we know. So there you go. Persimmon trees. Taylor, you learn something new every day, and that's yep. what this podcast is all about. We help teach the people. And footwear. <laughs> and footwear. <laughs> Give away footwear. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, so uh, so I really folks just need to pay attention to DeerCast right now, not only for the forecast, but also for like Taylor's hunts, pretty much anyone on the team. If they're, yeah. if something gets killed, it's going to be in DeerCast. Yep. You can see, and it's not just so you can see the kill, but you can learn from the tactics, like learn from what what these what these hunters are using to kill their deer and then apply that to your own hunts yeah so sure. it, there's a lot of information there and that's what we've kind of gone back to the basics i'd say this year with with our messaging for deer cast because it gets lost i think and there's so many valuable things inside the app and it's just like all right whether it's the 10 day whether it's track whether it's you know the the uh, understanding your deer cast portion i don't know if many people know that but in the the app there for the forecast if you go to the hourly there's a little spot that says understanding your deer cast below it mm-hmm. b- below the graph you click that all these videos of mark and terry explaining each actual condition weather condition and how it affects that specific phase of the deer season i mean those are really invaluable uh tools to, to go after i know everything you just said i already know oh <laughs> you're one of those guys <laughs> <laughs> tim's a know-it-all <laughs> no there's a lot of them out there <laughs> right, it's not just right. him <laughs> yeah they like to contact us sometimes <laughs> well taylor thanks so much for hopping on we really appreciate having you thank you guys thank and- you for having me and i hope it's supposed to be a really good weekend so hopefully we got a little group text going on that somebody killed fingers good. crossed yeah for sure well good luck i know you got a couple tags in your pocket. do you have a iowa tag this year or is it a, a gun tag that you have iowa gun yep yes. yep so you're yep. honed in on missouri for this part of the season and then you'll have yep. a, a iowa tag and then of course the missouri gun tag do you have yep. any Texas? are you going down to texas this year as well we are in about two weeks. We're going to go towards the end of October uh, with our bows to Texas. So Awesome. Sweet. Well, good yeah. luck. We look forward to tracking along on your uh, Instagram page and, of course, in DeerCast. And um, hopefully you have some good luck this weekend. Heck, yeah. Good luck to you guys. I hope we all kill them during this cold front that we're getting. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's exactly how I put it yesterday. I said there's a cold front. I put Relative. cold in, in quotations because yeah. it's not that cold, yeah. just colder than it's been. Yeah, <laughs> It's a normal but- front. Yeah, it's like 55 degrees and we went hunting and dad's like, oh, should we put our fleece on? <laughs> I was like, my well. I actually put a jacket on. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, weird weather. All right. All right. Well, thanks again, Taylor. Good luck and uh, keep us posted. All right. Sounds good. Good luck to y'all. All right. Until next time. Peace out. Peace out. The results are in. DeerCast said it was supposed to be a great night. Well, here you go. DeerCast said great. It doesn't exist anywhere else but in DeerCast. Hunters love DeerCast's exclusive deer movement forecast. Get ahead of your game with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DoD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's.